It's about creating conversations because it leads to other conversations. Arrow.net, A-R-R-O-E.net. We are unplugged and totally uncut with Riley Redgate. Hi, I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? Very well, very well. Your, your book is coming out at one of the greatest times because in reality, I realize that your book is set in you know 2072 and it talks about volcanoes and things like that. But to a young adult reader these days, my God, this book fits right into what we're facing these the in, during these chapters. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. Yeah, it's, uh, it does definitely feel even a little bit more zeitgeisty than I originally intended it to be. What was the current, you know, political co- conflicts out there and everything? Um, what, was it something that you were feeling in the moment? Because I, I'm also a writer, and I and I, I take from the universe. Yeah. I, I I bring the universe forward. Is it the same thing for you? Mm. Yeah, I think there's definitely a sense in which. Um, I mean, the book is not specifically about climate change mm-hmm. because the idea is that a single cataclysmic event, a single volcanic eruption will trigger like massive methane release that causes the earth to be uninhabitable. So in that way, that's an external force, whereas climate change is anthropogenic. And of course, we're generating it ourselves and it's a slower process. So it's not um, outright about climate change per se. Um, but I think there are a lot of feelings that I have toward climate change that I'm, I'm putting into the book where kind of there's a, a, a sensation of helplessness that the characters have toward what is happening. And I think that is uh, something that unfortunately a lot of people are struggling with right now, this feeling that, you know, we should be doing something. Mm-hmm. We can't do anything. We should be acting. We should be, you know, even if we change our behaviors, how are we supposed to transform, for instance, policy? Um, like we have this awareness that things are going wrong. Um, we have this dread that things are going wrong and yet we feel extremely powerless to change it and that we're, I don't know, that we're kind of barreling towards something that we can't avoid. That's sort of the, the feeling that I was I'm definitely channeling through a lot of this project. Well, I love um, I love where you put your focus because the world is set to end. Lee Chen is part of a, a small group of children uh, with, with their parents are, are world leaders. I mean, they, wow, we never get to see that side of the story. <laughs> yeah, it's um, they. I definitely wanted to have like. I think like that feeling of powerlessness that I'm that I'm trying to evoke is maybe a little bit more stark. Um, if the characters are only kind of one degree removed from power. So, like, they are the children of these change makers on Earth, um, and yet, you know, if they can't make change happen, then then who can? And then also, you know, they're, they're kind of trapped together trying to build a new society on this spaceship. Um, and then, even then, when they are self-governing, like a small group, we see kind of the same ripple effects and the same prejudices and the same barriers start to kind of erupt between them and they begin to perpetuate some of the same, um, same some of the same things that we saw happening on this future Earth, some of the same conflicts. So, yeah, it's, it's I didn't want to make them, these kids, like a 100% stand-in or proxy for either their powerful parents or uh or the nations that they come from, because they are an international cast. But I def- there's definitely an element there where they, they will feel representative of um, their backgrounds and, and the places where they come from. Where were you at when this, this one thought came into your mind? And, and, and the, the question is, what, what do you stand for when you're one of the last standing? My God, that, that is such a powerful <laughs> statement. Ah, thanks. I um yeah, that's definitely kind of the central moral question of the book is um will the will the main character be able to find her own morality? I think the so kind of where she is coming from as a, a child of the president is this kind of hyper publicized um, media forward if and she feels very nervous all the time about about either misrepresenting herself or saying something wrong or, or doing something bad that will then be preserved forever, which I think is a very kind of internet-y feeling. Um, but she, so kind of to that end, she has learned to kind of scrub away all trace of her taking stances on things or having opinions on things, because if you have an opinion, then that means that there are people who can disagree with you and and thereby, you know, kind of become your enemy. And so she has been living her life on damage control mode. But then once this uh, this eruption happens and she's thrust into kind of a position of power, um, it, it's no longer adequate at that point 
for her to kind of go with the flow and and uh, just be the consummate politician and diplomat and have no thoughts or feelings of her own. That's the point at which it begins to matter what she stands for. Um, so that's kind of where that question comes from, narratively speaking. You, you have a name inside your book, and I, I, I would love to know um, the, the, the uh, reason why you may have used it. I wonder if we're on the same page here. You use the name Lazarus. Now, Lazarus, in my mm-hmm. life, is a very powerful figure in the Bible. Is, is it, what, yeah. Were you inspired by that? Yeah, that, wasn't a, um, I, that name came kind of late in the process. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was trying to find like an appropriately... Um, you know, weighty name for the ship, um, one that would kind of evoke the the feelings of um, solemnity that I that I kind of wanted. Um, and yeah, so I was going through. Um, I, I had some ideas about drawing from either Greek myth or um, Egyptian myth, a name mm-hmm. that that would evoke you know feelings in in folks. Um, the the Lazarus, I think, was an appealing name for me because of this sense of resurrection and, and rebirth right, and right. the idea that it's a second chance and well at least it's supposed to be a second chance um so kind of contrasting that with like the the events of the ship and what they're you know what they go through <laughs> yeah that's that's meant to kind of echo off of it in, in certain ways, yeah. Well, it's such a powerful name, and it really does. It really gives that ship an opportunity to have a, a, a you know a lot of history behind it. And if people would take the time to do a little bit of research, they'll 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 really connect with you know what what this story you know goes even deeper than just the paragraphs. Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, I think um, I was actually brainstorming with a friend for that name as well. Um, the friend to whom I dedicated the book, uh, Leanne. So I'll have to mention to him um, that it connected with you. I love that. Yeah, yeah. you you aren't afraid to step into a pool of grief and trauma. I mean, you you really bring it out there in the way of you know going out there and you know it, for if 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 you were writing music, you would be creating song hooks. Well, you've got reading hooks mm. inside this book. <laughs> Thank you. I, it's definitely a, it's a tough subject. I think, um, you know, post-apocalyptic fiction is interesting because it, it does deal with the loss of everything and everyone you've ever known generally, um, which is almost like a, a grief too large to encapsulate sometimes. It, it, it kind of feels like it has to sort of exist in the background for the characters to be active at all. But yeah, these are a group of, you know, traumatized kids who are trying to process the fact that they have survived and no one else will. Mm. Um, and, you know, they have to they have to pre- prepare themselves on this ship to kind of take over leadership of the ship. They don't have any trained crew members or astronauts or anything. Um, so they are struggling to, to form something uh, close to a functional ship's crew, but at the same time, they are having private breakdowns. They're struggling with their own personal losses. And um, yeah, it was <laughs> not to make the book sound too cheerful and uplifting, <laughs> but yeah, that was definitely a central concern. Don't, don't you see that though as, as a teaching tool in the way that, because um, I, I work on the front line and I, and I talk with a lot of the young adults mm-hmm. and things like that. And I, and I do ask them about the current situation of, of, the, of the world. And, and as of late, they've been yeah. going, well, we don't think about it. But yet in your book, they do think about it and they do come together. <laughs> and, and I see this as, as, as a teaching tool of saying to the young adult readers, hey, look, you still have a voice. Use it. Yeah. Yeah, I would I would hope that that would be, you know, something that the younger generation would feel and I do think um I think there's a balance to be struck where you've got to separate yourself enough from the countless things that are going wrong in the universe in order to not be crushed by them and to feel as if you can act and have some ag- agency in your life. Um which is difficult to maintain that separation. Um but then you've also got to remain engaged enough and, and care enough and recognize that, you know, you are a person who has agency and can make choices for yourself to be able to go out and, and try and make the world a better place, even if that seems difficult or unachievable. Are, um, are so, we, are we yeah. going to see more science fiction from you? 
I have some science fiction ideas whirling around. <laughs> I, I'm a genre omnivore. I love reading everything. I love writing everything. Yep. Um, a couple of the projects I'm working on right now are, are high fantasy and, and dark fantasy. So that might be my next journey. I would I would like to do that. Um, but yeah, there's definitely um, some some more science fiction in my chaotic iPhone note that says story <laughs> ideas. So we'll see. So mm-hmm. are, are, are you a daily writer in the way of journaling? Because the way you write, you, it, it feels like you're speaking directly to me. And, and, and that's one of the things oh. that we learn in radio is that learn how to speak with the listener. Oh, that's, oh, that's interesting. Um, I, I don't actually journal. I have never journaled. I, I think I have tried a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think I'm honestly a little bit uncomfortable with kind of confessional, <laughs> purely confessional, uh, first person writing um, just from my perspective, I think I actually need to take on like the, the barrier of fiction in order to explore a lot of ideas that I have or feelings that I have, um, which is not to say that like I view fiction purely as a vessel for my own thoughts and feelings. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's interesting that you say that. I, I, I like the idea that the, the book would be approachable to folks and would, would feel confessional in that way. Mm-hmm. Definitely this book, the, the main character, the narrator, is she's a very earnest, serious person. She's like kind of a bleeding heart. And the kind of just distance between that and the persona that she puts forward to other people of being this unflappable kind of blank slate personality is very great. So I, I really care about people connecting with her and, and feeling as if she's a fully formed and, and, you know, uh, identifiable person. Um, so it's great to hear you say that. Wow. Riley, you've got to come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. (laughs) Well, thank you so much. Well, you be brilliant today. Okay. (laughs) You too.